Welcome, everybody. This is The Fall Line with Chaos and Company. I'm Dave Capron. I'm here with Angela Ross, and we're here to kick off another episode. And before we did that, do that, we'd like to uh, put a shout out to our friends of the podcast, Technical Blizzard, for helping us out and sponsoring the podcast, and also Nick's Boot Fitter, Boot Fitting, Nick's Boot Fitting over in uh, West Dover, Vermont, at uh, right next to Mount Snow. And um, Angelo, I was hoping you'd put another plug in there. Um, I think we need to do that right up till it happens for the Telepalooza down there at Seven Springs. It's pretty cool that uh, Blizzard stepped up and uh, sent a, is going to send a pair of skis, a pair of Brahmas, I believe, for the uh, for the event to uh, yeah. auction off or raffle off or however. Yeah, usually a raffle. Pretty excited about the event, Telepalooza, January 8th and 9th at, at Seven Springs. Some heavy hitters coming. We'll have Jim Shaw and Keith Rodney, current national team members. Uh, Mickey Stone has committed as a national team alumni. Um, J Nation, Sean Riggle, current Eastern Teleed staff. They're taking groups out, and it's just going to be a great time. A lot of, lot of good vibes, a couple of days of skiing. Details are at telemarker.org. Uh, home of the Appalachian Telemark Association, telemarker.org. You can get details there. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't put this surprise plug in, but we are, Brian, talking to the newly anointed and the newly appointed <laughs> PSIAE Eastern Division Alpine Development Team coach, Dave Capron. Uh, well deserved. Thank you, Angelo. Thanks, man. Yep. I'm pretty, pretty excited about that with the team and Going to have a good conversation with them this week and uh, get things kicked off for them. We're going to have a great training over at Killington in a couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, and but, I can uh, say I want to I want to interrupt and say I, I remember how excited you were for Troy when he made the national yes. team, and I yes. think those vibes are coming right back at you right now. Everybody's really really happy for it. Uh, cool, that's yeah. awesome, man. It's it's been cool. It's been nice. Everybody reaching out, and uh, I'm I'm uh, hopefully ready to go. I feel I'm ready to go. We'll see, and uh, hopefully the team will be happy. But and we're here tonight with one of the crew that I am so excited to talk about. We've been we've been putting this one off on purpose for everybody. I wanted to wait till after Brian, Mr. Brian Smith is here after he went through team training for his second term. I know you're not really calling last year a term, right? That was kind of an extension, Brian, wasn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. kind of an extension for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you're on your second term, which is awesome. And I'm very excited to talk to you tonight. Um, you've been big on the people skills task force. I know. Um, and, and all of our standards coming out and just talking skiing and, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for having me guys. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to, you know, listen to the, you know, the previous podcast that you do with other team members and, and ski personalities in general. It's, uh, this was a great idea that you guys just, you, you just nailed it, you know, taking this when the pandemic hit and running with it. And, uh, it's awesome. Yeah. Kudos to you guys. Oh, thanks. Appreciate right, thank that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. So um, how are things going? This is uh, late November and uh, we're just before Thanksgiving recording this. We're going to launch so everybody can have this right after Thanksgiving and maybe listen to it go to management seminar. But um, have you been hunting? Uh, a, few, a few hours, you know, yeah. not much. Yeah. Uh, this past weekend, my nephew and I did did uh, get out. We hunted in the pouring rain, which is always yeah. fun. And uh, we, we were outsmarted uh, <laughs> pretty much the whole day. But that's why they call it hunting and not catching. <laughs> <laughs> I figured you'd be out, but this must be that time of year. I know that uh, you want to get out in the woods. You want to do some hunting, maybe your last minute fishing, if there's anything to do. But you're probably banging nails and getting those last projects done before you get rolling. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're busy and that's a blessing. Um, all four of my guys and I, and, you know, we're, they're going to roll right into the end of January this year. You know, there's just a lot of growth in the market with people moving to more rural areas and stuff. And, and, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta make hay when you can, but, uh, this time of the year, you know, uh, being in the woods hunting, I tell people it's, it's a lot of hiking with a heavy object in your hand, you know, <laughs> But it's a it's a small season of mine that comes right at the kind of the end of construction and the beginning of ski season. And it's uh, it's something I love to do because when I when I'm climbing through the woods and I'm on a mountain, I'm on a mountain and uh, I spend most of my time in the woods thinking about the ski season to come. It's a, it's a great transition activity for sure. 
Cool. So we've skied together quite a bit through, um, you know, we were on dev team right around the same time. We're on there at the same time and then uh, ETS and came up through, which was really awesome. I had a great time. I had a great time hanging with you skiing. And, um, but I don't know a lot about like, you know, I know your big race background a little bit, but what, how did you learn? Like, when did it start? Like how young and uh, who taught you your first lesson? Do you even have a first lesson? Or was it like kind of Robin went up with friends and like threw her down Hunter? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I didn't get thrown down a hill. Um, for me, uh, I, it was almost an eight in a sense. Uh, I learned to ski at about two and a half, three years old. I don't remember learning. <clears throat> um, my earliest memory is skiing between my mom's legs with a pair of like vocal tigers with cub coes on them. And, and, and my mom pushing me away from her so that I would be kind of independent for about 50 feet. And then her, I can still in my memory, see her skis coming back in around me, you know, and grabbing back a hold of me and then shoving me out again. Um, but my beginning, I can't deny the fortune, the good fortune of being born into a family of ski instructors, my mom and dad started teaching skiing. Uh, my dad started teaching skiing in 1963, four. Um, and my mom started in like 68. Uh, so I'm the youngest of uh, two brothers and two adopted brothers. My two real brothers were proficient skiers and racers. So I, I was just kind of following in line, you know, so to speak. Um, but for me, uh, in the in central Adirondacks, there's a little ski area called Oak Mountain. It's got 600 and probably 80 vertical feet. It's a nice little hill. Uh, my parents' home to this day is on the shoulder of that mountain. And when I was a kid, <clears throat> at, at, you know, maybe seven, eight years old, after I learned to ski, that was, that was the place I went to when school got out. I never took the bus home. The bus brought me to the ski tow because my mom was, was running the ski school. And she was one of the first female uh, managers, if you will, of a ski school. Uh, and she was in that management role like in 1974, five, six. So, I, you know, it was just <clears throat> the environment. You know, I, I just, it, we were a skiing family and being the youngest, I didn't have a choice. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so so were you hooked right away or was it just ah, i gotta go to the hill you know when did you go like i just have to be there every second yeah um you know for me those early years like from three to like say age 10 11 it was just raising hell building jumps <laughs> having a ski patrol chase us off one slope ruin our jumps we would get on the lift go to the other side of the mountain build another jump you know and it was that was life you know just how can we hit jumps you know you're talking i don't want to date myself but you know you're talking <laughs> the late 70s and you know the mid late mm -hmm. 70s you know freestyle was king and you know and, and having a bandana on your knee and a pair of rafe sunglasses and a pair of olin mark fours you know that was that was the deal and uh I, I went from my home mountain in my hometown, Gore mountain was like Mount Everest to me when I was like six, it, my brothers were already ski racing at a Gore. They were older and they would come home on a Saturday and have these stories of Hawkeye and Chattamack and all these crazy, cool, steep trails. And, and I was like, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm stuck at the home mountain. And so for me at like age 10, 11, that was when my, my dad was like, okay, here's the deal. You know, you're old enough now to, you know, you're skiing, you know, at a level where he was comfortable bringing me there. And it was that transition just going from that small hometown mountain, which I love to this day. Um, but going to Gore just, it seemed like, I was going to Vail, you know what I mean? Yeah. In my mind, in those days, it was like the coolest thing. And I, right about 11, 12 years old, you know, I, I joined the race team at Gore. I started skiing a larger mountain, 
and exploring the mountain with friends, skiing in a pack of kids. And that was it. Once, once I started rat packing with other, other racer kids and stuff, I was like, yep, this is, this is me. This, this, this is, this is going to last for a while. (laughs) (laughs) Gee, Angelo, Brian getting chased around the hill by the patrol. We would have never imagined that, huh? That's, yeah, never. That's, like, that's what everybody on this podcast has said has happened to them. That might be a, yeah. might be that a thing. might have happened when I was <laughs> leading a group at Spring Rally once in White Bears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd, yeah, you'd, have, to, you'd have to ask Kim Seavers that. Yeah, yeah. I think I think D- Double D was involved in that one, wasn't he? Was, yeah, yeah. yeah, D- yeah Double yeah. D got himself out of trouble with a uh, – a massive towering tray of beers. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> yes. I I was there and remember that one. And oh yeah. Oh, if I imagine if we had a photo of Kim's face when yeah. she heard about that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Something along the lines of being Doug being asked by the patrol, how many people you got up there in that lift line you're skiing illegally? <laughs> oh, fuck you. <laughs> At about the ninth person, you know, I, th- I think uh, Doug went into serious negotiation. And, uh, uh, but we, we we got out of it unscathed, you know. Uh, yeah. They were pretty cool up there, man. That, that was that was pretty funny. But the skiing was good. And uh, oh, I yeah. could see where you guys were poaching in there. But, um, you know, you, I've known you for a while. That, and you're definitely, I don't know if tradition is, is the good word, but definitely on history. And, you know, in terms of skiing and, and you're really – you know, believe in that and, and look to it and, and talk fondly about it. And I think a lot of that must come from your mom and dad in terms of the history and, and your experience through ski teaching with them. And um, I mean, how many years now have you know, your dad has how many years in as a member? Uh, he is around 55 or six. Yeah, he got, yeah. he got his 50 year pin. I want to say a good five years ago. Yeah. And my mom is getting her 50 year pin. I think like this year, um so um yeah there's you know there's a tremendous amount of history there um and you know growing up and and hearing the stories about traveling to clinics and going to exams in the day you know and and my back in the 60s the east had what they called a regional team right Mm. and that regional team if you made it you basically you know you did events and but you did them in those days, you know, you know, right around Hickory Hill and, and Gore and, and West Mountain and maybe Maple Ridge and a few other ones. And so my dad, it, you know, it was kind of cool that, you know, he got to a place where beyond being the training manager at Gore for many years, um, you know, he was, you know, dabbled in in the association, if you will, by, you know, leading some clinics and being on a regional team. So definitely hearing all that growing up. And I I just, I just feel that without it, without the reflection and without honoring, you know, tradition and history, um, you can lose a real, the real color of the culture of what it is we do and where we're all from. And, and at my age now, you know, in my in my early 50s, you know, you know, you get this old <laughs> and you st- can start to reflect on 30, my own 35 years of being a member. And and, you know, I look back at when I first did an uh, associate's exam in 1987, uh, what it, what it was like to go through that and, and where it is now. Yeah, things are different. Processes are different. But connections and people are not. And I, there's just a lot of power and value, I think, in, in making sure that when you have an opportunity to speak to a group of people or friends, fellow examiners, just bullshit around that sharing these stories is, is what really, I think, continues to fuel the passion to, to, to move, to keep moving it forward. Yeah. Angela talks a lot to the, the history. I mean, he listens, he, he knows it too and thinks about it and he loves the style of back in the seventies, man. I think his, his favorite skier ever was like Wayne Wong. <laughs> pretty, pretty soft spot for Wayne. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. No, but I, what I find interesting is, is the variety when, when folks come on this show, the variety of everyone's pedigree. 
you know, some, some people were self-starters and, and didn't have any family connection. Um, that, that was my background. And then Brian has like fully pedigree, Dave, you're fully pedigreed from like birth. Um, <laughs> you know, and it, but it, the common ground though, is like Brian's saying, I think is, is the, the having the common experience and then cont- is t- and telling the stories. And then regardless of your background, you can all find common ground somewhere. And that's, that's cool. You know, that's not unique to skiing, but it's, it's special no matter what activity you do it with. Yeah, absolutely. You know, anytime I'm leading a group, no matter where it is, or, you know, maybe not so much in a, in an exam process, you know, cause there's a little more, uh, hyper focus with the people in your group. But when you're, when you're just skiing or training with people on staff at Highlands or back here in the East at uh, Gore or Whiteface, I, I never, <clears throat> I never just offer up a story or a reflection about the past or, or an experience that I've had or something I've heard from my, uh, my peers or my, my, you know, my elders in the industry. I, I never throw out a story for the sake of just a story. Like there's a reason and it goes to the people skills of gathering information, right? So that you can adapt what you're doing to make a solid connection. I'm on a constant hunt and vigil during a two day clinic to figure out how much common ground I have with people. And I find that through a well-timed poignant story conversation, that often I wait until I learn a little bit about something with the people I'm with. And when I start to sense that, Hey, there might be a connection here. I, I try to gravitate that other person to that connection through the vehicle of a story, through a reflection piece, you know, Um, it's somewhat manipulative in a sense that, you know, I, I, yeah, sometimes I, something just comes into my mind and I share it with people I'm skiing with and it makes the day colorful and it adds some passion and humor and, and some, uh, you know, uh, a- abstract thought, if you will. But like with the guests, you know, the last six years I've been teaching full time at, at Aspen, you know, and I ski with a lot of guests. And, and when I'm telling, you know, certain stories about my life to guests, there's a reason. And that is because it's relevant to the situation that I'm in with that guest in the moment. It's not just, I stop halfway down, you know, the backside of Highlands and be like, Oh, Hey, you know, back when I was, you know, seven years old, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's usually a story that is connected to something that we're doing in the moment. And it's, it has a connection that has relevance. It inspires and motivates people that's why I want to share. And, 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 and I use a lot of stories about ski history or my life because I th- honestly feel that it's if I can make the story relevant to something we're working on in the moment, it really anchors the message to people. And, uh, and, it's, and it's colorful in a sense. And, and it, you know, if you're with somebody for six hours, you know, you can only talk about foot to foot pressure so long, <laughs> you know, it gets pretty dry after a while. So, you, you know, you gotta, you gotta have some humor and tell some funny yeah. stories and, and enlighten the mood and, yeah. and, and engage people. It is yeah. really the end of the story is, is to just make an effort to engage, but it's intentional, you know, it's intentional because that's, where if I gather enough information uh, by listening to people answer some open-ended questions, closed-ended questions about them as people, and I can figure out that there's a connection, that something in my life or somebody in my life has something connected to their life, it makes that whole direct relationship between you and the people you're skiing with that much stronger. The second you feel that you have something in common with a hiking guide, a zipline tour guide, a ski, a ski pro, right? 
Uh, you travel for seven hours in a car with your family and you get out of the car and you're in the coast of New Hampshire and you're walking into a hotel. This happened to me uh, two years ago, right up in Hampton Beach. I walked in and the in the person behind the counter, right, had a baseball cap on that said white face scary at Lake Placid, New York. There you go. Twelve o'clock at night. I'm exhausted. I don't feel like carrying in all my boogie boards and all my stuff. This guy and I, I immediately made a connection about going to high school in Lake Placid for ski. But it was done right there. He was my pal in, in the moment. And, and you know, so uh, I was comfortable and, and, and thus that made our stay that much better right from the get go. So. Yeah. Hey, Angela, have you seen Brian's uh, video for the team tryout, this team tryout? The one on the hill that he did. I don't think uh, I look at his face. No. So I I watched your tryout video there that you do the like interview type one. And the wife and I watched that. And it was so awesome because it relates to this to me so much that um I don't know if you staged it or not, but when the when the women, you know, the folks skied up and you started chatting, then you had a connection, you knew who they were. I don't yeah. know if you staged it or not, but it didn't yeah. matter if you did because it was like and Andrew and I were here going. Even if he did that, that's perfect. That is the absolute epitome of how Brian interacts with folks and how he connects. And it was perfect. I mean, if that just happened out of the blue, because that's what you do. It, it didn't matter if it was staged or not for me. It was like, I've seen him do it. I know yeah. he does that. Just what you're talking about that. I, I think people should go because that's right on YouTube, isn't it? Your your video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Truth be told, I was. that's a very uh, popular uh, right side shoulder of Highlands. It's called Picnic Point. And from that vantage point, you have the most be- breathtaking views of the Maroon Bells looking towards Crested yeah. Butte. It's at, it's it's just magical spot. Yeah. And everybody goes there to have a quintessential photo. Well, I thought, well, what, a, what, what better place to stage up my video for the tryout? And, you know, and I was like, well, it's a midweek day. Nobody's going to show up. Well, as you saw, you know. Yeah. <laughs> couple of minutes into it, people are sliding in. And next thing you know, I'm taking their picture for them yeah. in the middle of my video. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. But I mean, that is it, 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 it. Andrew even said to me, she said, that's Brian. That's that. She said, it doesn't matter how that was done. That if that worked out like that, that was perfect. Because that's exactly how you interact that way and, and connect with people. And, and, and it just shows awesome in the people skills. I think that's my opinion. Angelo might have a different opinion of the under all that artistic stuff. No, I think I have the <laughs> same opinion. Um, <laughs> same opinion. When, Brian, a couple, you were talking about, I mean, you're, you're a storyteller clearly. Yes. Um, At times, but you were talking about that. Uh, you started going down that road and you, you described your technique for lack of a better term as manipulative. And you were almost apologetic about it, but that it, it reminded me of a conversation I had with Sue Kramer last summer when we we just started to really think about people skills and think about examining and training them. And uh, and Sue and I were having some conversations, and I had gone down this road of researching um, communication strategies. And I had taught some courses in my time as a teacher, where I taught the four very well known communication styles of passive and passive aggressive and aggressive, which are the three that are not, you know, not entirely positive the way they're the pictures painted in the literature. And then there's assertive, which is the good one, I statements and all that sort of thing. But when I was talking to Sue last summer and we were looking into this, I stumbled across some resource that had a fifth communication style and it was manipulative communication. And I started to read it a little bit and go down that road. And it's it's really interesting because I think man, the word manipulative or to manipulate has become, um, it's sort of given this negative connotation the way we use it. But the word itself is not negative or positive. It, it comes right. from the Latin manus, M-A-N-U-S, which means hand. And it just means to like physically, if you manipulate something, you physically alter it with your hand. And then we take that meaning to physically alter it through communication. But I think what you're doing is when you when you use that manipulate, I, I agree you're manipulating it, but in order to connect with people. 
And that's that's the mark of some pretty savvy people skills is, is what I'm trying to get at here is that you you wait, you wait. It's like you, you wait for your moment. Uh, and here it is. Clear connection. The runway is clear. Here's the story. And then, boom, it's this. Yeah, yeah it's this big bump toward connecting with somebody. It's, it's yeah, really well, the, well, well played. The key, the key piece to that is is the timing of it because otherwise you're just babbling on and on and you're just a ski pro who you know babbled on and on and on aimlessly uh, at stuff that was came off to the guest as aimless information you know what i mean meaning it had no real target right and <clears throat> yeah sure there's some fun stories you can share with folks that are really not relevant to what's going on in the moment whether pros i'm skiing with training or or guests but the timing of it, you know, and is the is the key piece. A well timed story that has a subject matter that you put some thought into, and that you know if you share this information, it's going to influence the behavior of the person who's hearing it in a in a way that creates motivation, um, creates. Uh, um uh excitement passion right uh makes them connect with you takes them out of the whatever that their distraction is that's that's what you want to do because otherwise it's just a, a just a story of information and they listen to it and they're kind of like oh yeah well that was interesting and then they go on worrying about their new boot fit up that they got in downtown aspen and it's not feeling right and you know one foot turns a little bit better than the other and you know and they're back to thinking about that um but like the the key piece is is well timed but the subject matter having relevance to the people you're you're with to the person you're with comes from listening you got to have a lot of that first, because when I'm listening to a guest um, ride the chairlift with me and in those first two or three runs, right, I'm gathering. Just like our definition of our people skills says, I'm gathering, I'm I'm in my mind, I'm categorizing the responses into different things. And, and when I hear something that I go, oh. I can connect to that. They just said something about being in the Northeast last year up in uh, the Adirondacks. Well, boom, I haven't even told them I'm from the Adirondacks yet. Now I know where I can, I can take and weave that piece of information. And so that this, the connection is more poignant and relevant and has relevancy. Um, you don't always get away with that, but when you're, skiing with a guest for the whole day or you're training with pros you just meet you travel to a ski resort and you're you're doing a, a bump clinic or whatever it doesn't matter um people are people uh, whether they're guests or pros and when i talk to ski pros and they talk about you know yeah you know last year i i was at bail and i had this examiner or last year i was at you know loon mountain and i skied with dave capron like I can immediately look at them and be like, you ski with Dave Capron? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, you know, I made examiner with that guy. You know, we go back 21 years, you know, I mean, we, they're like, no way, really? I'm like, yeah, like you, you, you skied with a great guy. You know, he's, this is, he's a long time friend of mine. And so bam, right there, it, there, boom. They're, they, now they're like, oh, geez, you know, I ski with Dave Capron and he knows Dave Capron. And, and that's another connection that's relevant that takes the door that you're trying to open, which allows you and the person to really connect. It just keeps opening it a little bit more. Each time you talk about something where there's some common ground, that doorway of trust just gets wider and wider and wider. And then pretty soon, you know, there's a foot stop at the bottom of that door and it never closes. You know, you, you end up um, what, what I like to call um, ending a two day event or ending a, a lesson with a client uh, as, uh, you know, making, making a, a true connection to friend. 
um, as opposed to just, you know, somebody going in and out of a process, you know? Um, yeah. You know, if that's, it's, it's, it's what really makes it connect, you know, John blue, who's on the national team, many, a lot of people know John, um, great guy, wealth of knowledge, fantastic skier, you know, when we were preparing for Interski Bulgaria, I was on the people skills team for that Interski, and John was leading off our indoor presentation. And we were sitting around in the hotel. John was like, Jonathan was like, you know, I got to kind of have like an open one liner. You know what I mean? I got to have a, you know, something to key, to key it off. And somehow or another, whether it was, collaborative between us or him or I or, or John, um, you know, he made a comment to the whole world stage before him that, you know, basically no matter how good of a medium radius turn, and he's got a damn good one, um, no matter how good of a medium radius turn that I have, that's not why people are, are going to come back and want to ski with me. But if they connect with me, on a human level, on a social level, and they befriend me and I befriend them, they, that's what is going to drive the needle for people to stay in the ski industry, continue to ski with him personally, or, or not leave the sport, is when they have moments where they interact with pros where the connection is sincere and real. It doesn't matter how good a short turn or medium radius turn it has. And I thought that was a, a really cool way that he started the presentation because it, it basically was saying, hey, you know, we're the United States. We have something to say about people skills. And here we go. Uh, so I, I never I never th forgot that. I thought that was a, a cool way to kind of throw that out there, you know. Um, and, and every ski school has people that – they may not be the hottest feet on your ski, on your staff, right? But for whatever reason, they're the ones that are always getting requested. They're always rolling people over. Their return rates are seventy five percent and higher, and it's because they connect. You know, it's real. Now, how did you develop that? Was it you know, just your storytelling and how you connect through that? Was that something you learned from? from family? Was there one particular, or is that just something, you know, cause sometimes that just, you're able to develop on your own. But a lot of times I know in families, there's kind of a, a, a long line of storytellers. <laughs> yeah. My, yeah. You know, my, my dad, my father is, uh, my dad is, he's kind of, uh, he's got a, uh, you know, quite the dichotomy in, in his ski uh, pedigree, if you will. Um, he's su like super technical. He's an engineer by trade, you know, and he knows he growing up with that man, you know, I like learning the fundamentals and learning ro rotation and up on waiting and all these things from the past and all that. Like I had, I like, I literally had a test given to me by him before I went to my exam where I had to write the answers of the definitions of all the terms in the, in the textbook. That was my dad, but, yeah. but he also had a, a humanistic social side to him where I can remember being at Gore uh, as a young ski instructor. My dad was still in the training world. He had left his role as the, the TD of the ski school. And I was in a clinic one time and we were skiing down the mountain, you know, and, you know, like he just stopped the whole group at a certain spot on the hill. And like the spot on the hill brought him to a memory he had from like 1965 when the year that Gore opened that how they were all skiing down the mountain at that spot. And the people who built the ski area left a giant bulldozer there. And one of the guys caught, you know, caught the corner of the blade of the, you know, of the bulldozer and wiped out and, you know, and led to this, you know, story. And like me and all these younger guys on the ski school were standing around looking at each other, like, what, where's that coming from? You know, but it was humorous. It was hilarious. And it was, uh, it was timely, his story. Uh, so I definitely picked it up from, from <laughs> him, for sure. 
<laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. I figured it had to be with, you know, especially around the hunting camp and going out, you know, at the end of the day, when you come back after the hunt and yeah. eating dinner, it's like, usually the stories start telling then. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy. You know, growing up, I had four older uncles. My dad had older brothers and sisters, all D-Day survivors, right? Uh, World War II Philippine battle. These guys, you know, saw saw war at, at its worst, right? And yeah, you know, I can remember being a young teenager and listening to my Uncle Gordon talk about, you know, uh, a plane hitting the bow of his ship and, and what they did to survive. And, you know, and, and, and remember being on the edge of my seat at the hunting lodge, literally, you know, at the edge of my seat, you know, like, I can't believe I'm hearing this. Like, is this even real? And, yeah. and the power of it, I guess, is really what struck me is the power of, of, of stories and, and, and things that bring out emotion in people. Um, and, and now where I am today, you know, in the ski world, I've had enough interactions over the last 20 some years as a educator that I've seen what, what some of the power of, of, you know, a timely poignant relevant key thing is relevant story can do to the group dynamic. Look at your people skills and, and, and what it, you know, you can either identify a group dynamic amongst a group, right. And, and at least see and, and identify it as a group, you can foster the dynamics that are happening in a group, or you can contribute and adapt to those dynamics and I think when, when you have poignant interactions or stories that, you know, they're mostly hubbed around skiing and sometimes they're not, but when, when you are picking a subject matter to share with guests or pros, you're, I'm picking a subject matter that I know has relevancy to either everybody in the group or one or two specific people that I really want this to open up something in their, in their mind about what they're doing with their skiing. And that's where the manipulative part is, Angelo, you know, um, it's powerful. Um, and it's good entertainment. Let's be honest. You know, I mean, I know when I take events, I, I can remember going on the road and, and going to get my two day credit down at Hunter or out to Killington or something. It was fun to ski with an examiner who, you know, told some stories about their journey and, and our, you know, or racing or the time they were on that trail and, you know, got clipped by somebody and whatever, you know what I mean? It, it, it's just, it's, it's part of it, you know, and it's uh, yeah, it makes for, makes for good, good dynamics. I'd put it as artful, you know, you got to be creative builds. You got to be an artist. It's, it's more, you know, you manipulate the paint, you manipulate the, the things and, you know, and uh, you know, Angelo, we've talked about it a lot in terms of uh, you know, part of the podcast is trying to let people know more about us. I mean, I was Angelo's big thing as we started I and mean, you can speak to it, Angelo, you know, having the opportunity to get to know the staff and some of the folks we had on that they might not know as guests. It, I, coming up here in the corner of Pennsylvania, the southwest corner of Pennsylvania, which is almost Ohio, but not quite, um, <laughs> <laughs> nor West Virginia, nor Maryland. But we can throw a stone and hit about all of them, you know. But, but growing up here, it's geographically challenged. It's far from uh, the hub of our region which is new england obviously and so the interactions we had with um people who were really really good at this like i mean people who had committed their lifestyle to it full timers on the road and in those days in the in the 80s we would see bob shostick and lanny tapley and steve moore was my level one examiner and pete stransky would travel with those guys and, there, and it was that crew that did a lot of travel here our interactions with them were were few and far between but to this day 2021 
people still tell stories about when Shostak and Billy and Steve and Lanny and Peter and those guys were here. That's that's the power of the connection. But then to get to Dave's point, the flip side is then when you're that far away and, and you know, we're sort of isolated in southwestern Pennsylvania, but we're definitely not as isolated as some areas. Um, so I don't, I'm not like, it's not a, not a, not a sad saga or anything like that. But, um, when you do have those limited interactions with folks, it's also real easy to make assumptions about them. Help my impression of Bob and Billy and Lanny and those guys would like, they lived in a dorm somewhere together <laughs> all the time and took their meals together. And then like when it was time to. Uh, come down to Pennsylvania. Who was the president? Nat Putnam. And I picture yeah. Nat putting them on a plane and <laughs> flying them down here, you know, and, but you make all these assumptions. So when we, when Dave and I were talking about the podcast in its infancy, which was like you said, Brian, during the, the pandemic, when we ended up on the, on the Eastern e-learning task force together and we didn't know each other all that well, um, but started talking about well, how, how, and, then, and to give Dave, this was Dave's baby. This was to give him full credit for the idea. But he asked me about my interest level. And then like, what do you, how would we go about something like this? And it was about, um, let's make sure that anybody who listens can connect with the people that we have on. It's super easy. And it's really funny because we had dinner. Amanda and I had dinner last weekend at a friend's house, Gretty, my ski instructor for she's Austria and she's close to our mom's age and just a tremendous lady just grew up legit ski town, you know, and ended up in the States like many, many uh, college kids in that generation did. And she, she stayed here and she, she said, but she really liked the podcast with Kelly Weibel. She was like, I really like that Swiss kid you had on there. And, <laughs> but she said, um, when she started to listen, um, she was expecting more technique, you know, Mm -hmm. Why aren't you talking about how to do this, this, and this? Where's A? She kept saying, where's A, B, C, D? Where's A, B, C, D? And I said, man, you can get that anywhere. There's a billion yeah. Facebook groups. There's a million <clears throat> YouTube channels. But mm -hmm. where are you just going to hear people sit around and bullshit about stuff like we do? And right. that, that, was, that was the angle we decided to take. And yeah, uh, some people seem to respond to it. I think we're fortunate in that way. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a great I, – I agree. I mean – yeah, you know, talking shop is fun and, and talking about how we move on skis. And I mean, how many times have we all had a beer at, you know, the bar at Mount Snow and, and you look across the room and there's Capron over there talking with his hands. And, and then 10 minutes later, I'm doing it. And, and you know, and, it, and, and, and uh, you know, and, and that's that's part of it. And, and that that's good. Um, but. There's a word in the people skills and the learning outcomes of level three, um, level two, level three, that that word is belonging. And <clears throat> all of us, no matter who you are in this industry, when we get in the car, whether you're the course conductor for the event or you're a participant in the event, we all go there. And getting our technical coaching is an outcome we want, right? And we know that part's going to happen on the hill. You know, I know Capron's going to say something about my left turn, you know. <laughs> and, um, but I, but what I look forward to is when I go out to dinner with Capron and I'm skiing in his group. And, 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 I, and I'm meeting some other pros or, or Alex, my wife is with me and, and, and I'm watching her connect with Dave and, and, and watching her skiing get better. And, and then we celebrate that with dinner and a beer and, 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 and that connection part. And, and yeah. it's human nature to want to feel a sense of belonging. 
I don't care if you're the examiner running the group for two days or you're a participant. We all, you know, we all really enjoy that. I mean, I'm looking forward to masters in a few weeks, right? Yeah. I'm oh, stoked yeah. to go skiing. I am ripping ready to go ski. Um, my wife and I are already planning what we're going to bring for breakfast guys, by the way. Oh, the um, waffles, the waffles, waffles, waffles. waffles. <laughs> and, uh, and, but like, I'm most excited about seeing yeah. all, all the fellow teammates, all fellow Eastern examiners. And, and then of course, all the familiar members that are there and, 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 and having a beer at the sponsor party and, you know, and, and listening to music and, and stuff like that. And it's, uh, it's, that's the stuff that really makes the other stuff worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, You know, we'll all figure out our left turn from our right turn eventually, you know, but you know, it's, it's even better when you can drive home and go, yeah, I really connected with these people and uh, made some new friends and uh, got some lifelong friends. And that's, that's the key. That's the key thing is that sense of belonging. And that's why, you know, a good level three instructor, a good clinician, right. You, you know that you guys have done this, Dave. You've done uh, groups where all of a sudden it's day one or the morning of day two, and you realize, wow, those two folks over there that are in the group, I really haven't really, really haven't, you know, I, I'm, they're, they're on the fringe of the dynamics that I created the day before. And you say to yourself, I'm aware of that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an attempt a manipulative attempt to make sure that they come into the fold. They know that I'm sincerely like, Hey, I want to ride up with you two guys the next couple lift rides. Right. And you start really, you know, making sure that no, you know, nobody's left out out of the circle, so to speak. And, and, and a good clinicians do that. You know, they make sure that there's a lift ride with each person in the group every day, you know, well, I, I see it right now. Like, you know, Angela was hitting me there as a dev team coach. You know, I'm just taking over and it's just geographics. There's some dev teamers I don't know as well as others. And, you know, I have pegged that a little bit, you know, I mean, Angela talks about this, that, you know, being in certain areas, they don't get to see us. And sure. I see, you know, certain ones all the time because they're close to me. So you've got to make that effort to right. which ones haven't I, which ones haven't had the time. So when I'm at training, you know, it's, I've got to be with all of them, all 30, some of them, but there's a few that need, you know, that chairlift ride, that extra time that they don't get that I'm going to see the phone call being. or the, or the random phone yeah. call that you might, you might see a couple of dev teamers at your home mountain or, or whatever yeah. at an event, but the ones that are on the fringe, you might have to yeah. adapt your behavior in a way that okay, I'm going to do something different because they're way out in Seven Springs or way out in Western New York or whatever it may be. And so I'm going to check in. I'm going to call these guys once a week, you know, and, and yeah. yeah and, and, and they, and that'll go a million miles, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Angelo, his, his wife, you know, she, her, her my, my wife too. They're kind of like, when are you guys going to stop talking, you know, just on the phone and we <laughs> see each other. What we've been in the same place once in what two years <laughs> yeah that's hilarious <laughs> yeah that was a surprise right See, that, yeah, that totally contradicts my thought i thought i think i thought you lived in new hampshire angelo like down the road from day <laughs> that putnam flies us into all of our events together <laughs> yeah. no yeah, somebody we, asked me who was it dave i just i told told you the, uh, the other yeah. day somebody oh it was, yes, McVicker. was it? brian yeah. mcvicker texted me and he was asking about a couple of the episodes and he's like how long have you known dave and i was like yeah, a yeah. couple of years there he asked he said how did you get to know dave i said just through yeah. like ed staff stuff and oh i thought you guys went to college or something i was like <laughs> nah, he, he couldn't get into college <laughs> yeah we had a reading show back in the 80s <laughs> We did, man. We did. Oh, man. I'm just yeah, kidding. Did. Dave went to college. I did. Yeah. I, nah. went, I, stu- I studied dirt, though, man. You know, I didn't we, had study the same, too hard. we had the same major, though, just two different states. That, that's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So, so is that what drew you, you know, the, the connection? Like, I mean, this is a very, in many ways, individual sport. 
but you know, racing, I mean, I know you have a competitive side, so I know that was part of it and, you know, chasing your brothers and they, but I mean, did you enjoy that team? Cause as much as, you know, when I was on the race teams in high school, it wasn't, I mean, we had our gig and we yeah. it was definitely individual, but there was a team aspect and there was yeah. more than one person scored for the team. And, mm-hmm. you know, that, that had to be part of it for you. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, you know, I had the good fortune of spending a couple of seasons in high school going to an academy uh, and skiing with Dave Wen. you know, Dave, uh, coach general, he was my coach in high school. And uh, how full circle is that now? Now, I literally just had a phone call with them today about, you know, examiner training coming up and stuff. And yeah. every time I get on the phone, I'm, I I have a little giggle where I'm like, I can't <laughs> believe I'm talking to my 15 year old, 16 year old race coach. <laughs> um, and uh, and he still kicks ass and takes names, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, I had the fortune of, of, of going to high school in Lake Placid and, and going to a legit academy um, and, and experiencing, you know, the van. You know, being being in the van with my my Sony Walkman and, uh, you know, and jam and eye of the tiger as we pulled yeah. into, you know, uh, the eastern J.O.'s at Mount Snow or, or up at Sugarloaf, whatever it may be. Um, and, and, it, and yeah, you know, that that was a big part of it. And. My my time in Lake Placid in ski racing. I I honestly think that what I experienced with Dave when in the, in the mountain house Academy, which became national sports Academy was that's where the seed of being a student of the sport was planted in me where I, where where we watched video in those days, you know, of ourselves, you know, and, and, and started to analyze stuff. Right. Up until then it was like, yeah, whatever, you know, I just do this. I don't really know how I'm doing it, but I'm getting through the course and the times are pretty good and, and I'm having fun. But by the time I got out of high school and, and was like 19, you know, I, I start, I, I was understanding a little bit about <clears throat> how my skis bent and, you know, and how, and what they did for me. Um, and, and that formal kind of racing background, that formality piece of racing is what I lean on today to, keep me in a growth mindset. Um, I'm married to somebody who <clears throat> is extremely talented <clears throat> at, at displaying and demonstrating a growth mindset. Uh, you know, you guys know Alex, she's mm-hmm. one of us. Yes. Um, you, when you go ski with Alex, it's hard to have, it's hard to not have a good day. Um, you know, she's all about it. There's no, there's no wall. There's no, oh, oh, you gave me some feedback on my skiing. And now I'm going to go retreat into a turtle shell and, and, and mull it over and get all heady. You know, um, you know, I, 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 I'm fortunate. I use her as a reference because, you know, she demonstrates that beautifully, you know, and, and my racing world was, you know, and if anybody knows Dave, when he's, he was a lot today, like he was, you know, 30, 40 years ago and when it was like, Hey, you know, don't whine about it. You know, you're doing this on your skis. I want you to do this on your skis. And here's what I want you to think about. And it, it was the first time in my life as a junior, senior high school where it was like, okay, stop worrying about what it looks like. Stop worrying about the, the ego piece. Let's, let's get better at this. And I never lost that. And honestly, I wasn't, for the lack of a better analogy, you know, I wasn't an Eric Lipton, you know, not, no, nothing against Eric, fantastic skier, one of the best, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not one of the Flynn twins from who just made the team now who are amazing young skiers, right? Um, my journey to the national team and Dave, you know, this, you know, we were on several teams together, you know, mine was incremental Mm -hmm. and it was a journey through, you know, four different divisional tryouts, three or four national team tryouts, right. Before I was selected. But I think the piece that I got from going to high school in Lake Placid and coming from a formal race deal was, 
It's kind of like Tom Hanks is saying, you know, there's no crying in baseball. You know, there's no crying when the coach says, well, that run sucked and this is why it sucked. And here's how you can do it better. And I want you to work on this. It just created a growth mindset that that stuck with me. And I honestly don't think I'd be sitting here as a team member today uh, on a second term um, if I didn't have that, because what I can say about my tryouts and the feedback I received from selectors, Carol Levine, Mike Porter, Dave Merriam, you know, several of them, the list goes on and on, was this is what you're doing way better than you did the last trial. Okay, great. Awesome. That's, that's, a, that's another rung in the ladder or two, right? Then I go to the next tryout. Wow, yeah, I was expecting you to ski this way or that way. I had this image and wow, you're really cleaning this up. And man, this part of your puzzle is getting better. Oh, okay, off to the next tryout. Okay. And the point is, if you're going to show up like I did for three or four tryouts and keep banging your head on the wall, at least bring something each tryout that makes some of the senior selectors go, that's different. That's growth. The best compliment I ever received was in 16 when I made the team, Mike Porter took me out in the hallway when the team was announced and he said, Hey, come over here. Right. You never say no. And (laughs) I went out, I I went out and Porter looked at me and he says, you know, you just kept bringing it all these years, Smitty. You didn't, come with the same dance each time you came with something a little better a little more refined a better tactic whatever it was right you know it wasn't like i was blowing people's doors off but it was that was the best compliment you know that with time with age like fine wine some things get better right but they don't get better if you're if you're closed minded and you get frustrated with yourself and you say, you know what, I've grown, I'm not going to change or, or you just give up in a sense that you you're making us change. And maybe your best friend says to you, wow, you're really skiing different. Look at the video and you look at it and go, well, that's a little bit of a change, right? Those little bits, when you start to add one of those on top of another, on top of another, and eight years goes by, 10 years goes by. Well, the next thing you know, you know, uh, they're calling your name. And I I love that. I mean, that's, that's, I think just the tenacity and and the, the continued growth is, is important. I hope people notice that. And I I know a lot of people that do, but I hope people that don't know you or listen to podcasts because it's something we hear a lot. I mean, there's not just Brian, but I mean, people are able, if they keep working hard and listen, yeah. you know, they learn, man, they listen, they, they learned it from Angelo. I'm going to try that, dude. I'll be 72 when I make the team. I'll be the <laughs> oldest person to make it. <laughs> I think I'm it trying like now. <laughs> six months after my, the first uh, term, you know, when I made the team the first time, I like Bob Barnes from Winter Park called me out of the, out of the blue in the summertime. He's like, Hey, Smitty, I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, you know, I was thinking, I think you're the oldest rookie ever to make the team. And I'm like, Bob, it's July 11th and a Tuesday. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I, ju- I just wanted you to know that. You should be really proud about that. Of course I was, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think another thing that's awesome is that you've never left the team. You know, in my view, like you, you you've broadened your horizons, your uh, examiner out west in Rocky Mountain. And but you, you've full fledged and never let it falter here in the east no. and uh, and and keep both. And I think that's kind of neat. It, to me, it falls right into line where we're moving of, um, you know, more of that collaboration across the country. Yeah. You know, I owe a lot of that to Alex, you know, at, at, I mean, going out west to work. Right. You know, you know, the being on the board of directors, you know, I was part of that second wave of examiner exchange. Right. I think Peter Howard and I went uh, together uh, 
to uh, out to Vail, you know, and of course, you know, you're skiing with Katie and Kip and, and Jonathan, you know, they're pretty good salespeople. <laughs> <laughs> they work at that yeah. and, you know, and they, they pitched it pretty good. And, but, um, you know, you know, my wife, Alex, you know, is a, is a Colorado U graduate, right? She was a, a biathlete for them out there and, and, and graduate of uh, Gould Academy in Maine. Um, you know, she had a desire to want to, you know, experience teaching, you know, at a resort like that, you know, and before the girls, I mean, Ellie was just, you know, three when we went out there and Tegan was literally like, you know, uh, you know, Ellie was three and a half and Tegan was like six months old. And I was like, if we're going to do it, we got to do it now. Um, so going out there, you know, was, was never about like, I'm done with one thing and now I'm going to go do another. I said to Alex, you know what? I have an established construction company that I'm too old to recreate. I'd be foolish to shoot myself in the foot and get rid of it and try to pick up, you know, do it somewhere else. So I said, let's, let's do our winters. Let's do five years. Well, five years became, you know, six or seven. And, um, but it was never about abandoning one to do the other. It was about, okay, we're going to go do this, but we're willing to pay dues in both the Eastern division and Rocky mountain division, which we do to this day. And, and for the first four years, we had no problem. It was, it was worth our financial investment to fly ourselves back to our home in Northern New York, get in our car here and go do eight days worth of events for, for the division in the East and then fly back out and be on the snow for, for Jonathan and the ski school and Katie at the ski school at Highlands. And Alex and I were like, why, why don't we just demonstrate with our family? Like the fact that there really isn't all these different divisions. There really isn't. That's just a business model. That's just a geographical organizational tool that they created years ago. And, and, and hopefully our, you know, and I think some of our friends, you know, you guys and some of our close friends recognize that it, I'm old, I'm I'm an Eastern boy, you know. Mm-hmm. I just happen to love skiing in Colorado, you know. But I but my blood runs deep, you know. Still, water runs deep for me in the East, you know, and it always will. But I, Alex, and I wanted to to, to demonstrate to our to people that look, you know, you know, it isn't one or the other; okay. it's both. And we, you know, not everybody has the means of it, and there there are several people that do what we do. You know, Mike tunes Bridgewater goes to snow, snow mass. He bounces back and forth to to the East and we're not the only ones, but it was, it was just, we just hoped Alex and I hope that people would recognize that, you know, it was, it was about enjoying the opportunity while our kids were young. I learned so much more about ski teaching when I went back. I, I, I had a radio in my, on my chest for 20 years at Gore. And I was a supervisor, training manager. And then when I got out to Colorado, I taught skiing. I was a line instructor for six years full time. And it was the best thing I ever did for my ski career. Because one, it it humbled me again real quick about, you know, less is more. You know, when you're skiing with pros, you have the liberty to give a little more because they understand the content coming to the event. But when you're skiing with somebody from San Francisco who skis nine days a year, one little nugget goes the entire four days. And the rest of the time, we're bantering like we are now. We're bullshit. (laughs) We're we're going to lunch. We're having fun. (laughs) You know, and uh, it was it was a great thing. And. Um, I also feel that there's benefit to having ed staff who have experienced working in different divisions. And, and, and now that we're my family, we're, we're, we're back here in the East and, and we're kind of, this is our hub again. We still have our place out in Colorado. I'm still on the staff there. I'm in fact, I'm headed out there for Christmas. Um, and I, I plan to, you know, keep my, my part-time, my peak part-time relationship rocking and rolling for as long as I can. Um, and, but I'm also genuinely excited to to put a 30, 40 day Eastern schedule in and, and, and and hopefully see you guys and, 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 and cruise the East. Um, because in my mind, and I said this once as a board member in the East, 
our members, a good day for our association is when our members forget about what their division in and they just recognize they're in one kick-ass association that no matter where they go, they're going to be accepted. They're going to be respected. Doesn't matter. The snow on the top of Whiteface is just as white as it is at the top of Aspen Highlands, you know, and it, it doesn't matter, you know. So that was a, a, a big, a big, you know, a big driver for, for Alex and I, you know, to do this. Was one, you know, one, the experience, two, we, we, we felt, we, you know, we could bring something back and forth that would, that would be, that would contribute, you know, to a, to a good goal. Angelo wants to do it. I think once you see people doing it, it becomes more possible. You know, like once you realize people can, you know, make a living or or, or mm -hmm. even do it on an extended vacation, it it uh, it makes it seem easier for you to do. And then the the anytime you do something like that, um, take yourself out of your comfort zone and go somewhere else. It's just this growth by leaps and bounds that's just all valuable you know oh absolutely my first day ever skiing at aspen highland was in uniform never ever skied there ever and you know put a uniform on went out there and skied till like 11 o'clock and bam i had uh, an adult programs lesson you know three guys from uh, california in their mid-40s they all were you know executives together at the same company you know, and I'm, uh, you know, here I am on a lift whipping out a trail map and they're looking at me like, really? What's the deal here, man? <laughs> we have a pro that has no idea where we're going. And uh, yeah, and it was fun. I told him I made a joke about it. I became the humorous introduction of the lesson. And, and one of the guys actually skied there a lot. And he's like, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you where to go. You tell us how to do it. So boom, that, that was my, that was my introduction to teaching out West right, <laughs> right there. So yeah, big, all, all good. But big, big growth at, at one time, like you said earlier on, you, you you were at your at your home mountain. What was it, Oak Mountain? And then the world opened up when you went to Gore. Yeah, and oh, here yeah. you are. Yeah, it's every time you pop out of your comfort zone and end up somewhere bigger or smaller, just somewhere different. Yeah, just yeah. You, you grow that way. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, it was. You know, there's a lot. To learn, I mean, it's Colorado, you know, it's not that it's better. It's just, it's different. Uh, it's, it's hugely destination in a sense. And I learned real quick that if you're going to work in a place like Aspen, then, then less stress about whether you're technically accurate in your lesson or not. And more focus on paying attention to the kind of energy that's 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 happening between you and your guest, and and in influencing that energy by listening to who they are, what they're saying, what they like, what they don't like, and using all that information to to to, to enhance and influence. Um, their likability of you and your likability of them and making that connection because um, when they call you back the next year, you know, that's, and you start plugging in your dates during the peak holidays times, like right now, you know, most my season for what days I have available for Aspen, they're, they're taken. They're already taken by, by, by people. I'm, you know, I've skied with five years in a row now or four years in a row. And, and it's not because of a good short term. It's because of, of the little things extra I do for them and connecting and, and, and making sure I'm in the moment and I'm present with them. And that's the big thing, especially with kids. Maybe if Dave yeah. can fix up that left turn, you'll get more clients next year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'll work on that. We'll see, we'll see it in training. If I see him coming down, I'll give him some feedback. I know, man. I'm going to be lifting my right foot just to make damn sure I'm on my left foot. <laughs> hey, Brian, thanks so much for joining us. And um, I hope we can have you back throughout the season here or um, definitely 
at some point and um we're gonna sign off now but we 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 definitely have the invitation out to hopefully come back maybe after we've had a few months on snow and chat about some things what's going on and uh thanks for being here this is the fall line with oh no go ahead brian you got some no no thank you thank you guys and i just want to just give a shout out um you know my my dad's turning 80 this year and uh it was kind of a uh a bit of a um emotional moment the other day he called me and he and it was a real weird situation he said i want to buy the last pair of new skis i'm ever going to buy and that really meant something to me and i called up barclay at vocal and i said no i'm going to pay for, i want to i'm buying my dad a pair of skis yeah. and they got delivered today and uh, i'm excited to bring them to him, but just the way he put that, you know, you know, a man who's now, you know, on the doorstep of 80, he's got 56 years of teaching. And I, and I just want to end the, my time here with you guys tonight. You know, he left the teaching world two years ago as a paid instructor and is now back in my hometown at Oak mountain (laughs) skiing out of the same house I grew up on volunteering his time on Saturday and Sunday to ski with seven eight nine and ten year old boys that's awesome that and, is uh, awesome that's good and uh that i'll just leave it right there that's great history man that's hopefully people will learn from that yeah and 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 uh view it as something they want to emulate so thanks yeah. a bunch and uh this has been the fall line with chaos and company shout outs to our friends at blizzard technica and nick's boot fitting over at mount snow thanks Brian. thanks guys <laughs>